Hi, I'm Nancy O'Neill. On Suncoast FYI today are Mary Lee Namaka from the Sarasota County Humane Society, Haley Rutger from the Moat Marine Laboratory to talk about the upcoming Lionfish Derby, and Ann Chandra from CADA, all next on Suncoast FYI. The Humane Society of Sarasota County is known for helping our furry friends find forever homes, but they also help them stay healthy all year long. Joining us now is clinical manager Mary Lee Mayaka talking about the animal clinic. How you doing? Hi, good. Welcome to the show. And who did you bring with us? This is Elsa. She's a Humane Society um, alumni. So she was, uh, I adopted her from the animals, uh, for the Humane Society Aww. of Sarasota County. And how long have you had her? I've had her about three and a half years. Okay. Yeah. And she's just beautiful. She has the kindest, softest, most gentle eyes. And Thank I, you. And I can see why you adopted her. She's a great ambassador for the breed. So we love her. <laughs> okay, so the animal clinic. We know about the shelter, yes. and to be honest with you, when I saw that you were coming on the program, I hadn't heard about the clinic. So how long has that been involved, and, and tell, us, tell us about it, please. The, um, we have actually been open since February of 2016. So it's um, fairly new. It is fairly, fairly new. new. Okay. We, um, we've, so it's just about two and a half years, mm -hmm. um, and it's been kind of an incredible ride. We didn't expect um, the, the community uh, feedback that we've gotten, um, but we're really excited to be there. Mm -hmm. So where is it in relationship to the shelter? Are they in the same building? Not in the same building. We're just a few blocks away. Um, the shelter is located on 15th Street, but we are just on the corner of Tuttle and 12th. Okay, corner of Tuttle. That's close. Very, yep, very just close around the close. corner. Okay. Now, I mean, it's, it seems obvious, but why was the clinic started, and why wasn't it started sooner, actually? Well, I, definitely our executive uh, executive director, Kristen Benson, has been pushing really hard to get that to get the clinic up and running. Mm -hmm. She knew that there was a need for it in our community. Um, we have a lot of people who come to the shelter looking for care. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just um, it was a no brainer to get the clinic up and running um, to be able to provide provide more affordable care for our community. Okay, so is it just for people who have adopted animals from the shelter, or can anyone go there? Mary? Anyone can go, yes. Yeah, so we, we don't have any restrictions on the clients that we see. And we see a little bit of everybody. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's open to the public. Um, so we see everyone. Okay. Is there a sliding scale or is it just... Uh, no, we, we definitely just are package pricing for our vaccinations or a set price mm -hmm. um, no matter, you know, um, no matter the income. Okay. Um, so it, we, we just set our prices to try to be more affordable. It's a little difficult to track with, with a sliding scale. So sure. this was this was what works best for us. Okay. And what type of services do you provide? We actually, um, we're a full service veterinary hospital. Some people think that because we are um, the human society that we mm -hmm. were a vaccination or spay neuter clinic mm -hmm. but we're actually we function just like a regular veterinary hospital we provide wellness care geriatric care dentistry orthopedic surgery um, so we uh, we are really no different and we run no differently than a regular veterinary hospital. Okay. Do you have normal hours though or is it a 24-hour hospital? We Right now we are open from 8 to 5 Monday, and, Monday through Friday uh -huh. and Saturday we're open from 8 to 12. If okay. there's an emergency we do refer to the emergency hospitals after okay. hours. Okay, so now when you say a help, uh, wellness program. Mm -hmm. What what does that encompass? That is basically trying to keep our pets healthy. Um, it, it, it's vaccinations, preventatives, routine testing for heartworms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure um, they're on preventatives to prevent them getting intestinal parasites and heartworms. Treating fleas. So wellness just encompasses trying to keep our dogs as healthy as possible. Okay. And what can, in addition to that, how can um, pet owners keep their pets healthy? Uh, preventatives, uh, preventative care is the most important. Okay. Um, like I mentioned, heartworm preventative is very important. Sure. We, uh, within Florida, mosquitoes right. transmit heartworm disease. Mm -hmm. Elsa actually had, she was a heartworm positive dog and had to go through treatment. Um, so treatment's very hard. So being able to provide preventatives such as heartworm prevention, flea prevention, mm -hmm. that can, and uh, tick, yeah, tick prevention, yeah. um, vaccinations. 
um, to make sure that they don't um, pick up rabies from our wildlife or sure. you know parvo. Okay. So um, vaccinations on an annual basis are very important. Annual basis. I was annual just going to ask you. So yes. everybody should come in. Is it what's the annual the fee for the annual checkup? So for our dogs. Our, we have packages, and yep. the packages help um, reduce the cost. Okay. Um, so we bundle things together. So depending on annual, what they yeah, need. Yeah. So annual vaccines for a dog with a rabies, their full exam, mm -hmm. distemper vaccination, um, heartworm tests, mm -hmm. um, check their stool sample to make sure there's no parasites. That runs about seventy-five dollars. Okay. So that that sounds very reasonable and a great way to keep your pet healthy. Absolutely. I mean, re very very it's, reasonable. It's very important. The okay. more preventative care that you can provide, then hopefully the less that you're dealing with down the road. Okay. And do you need appointments like your regular vet? Yes. Okay. We do go by appointments. Um, it just helps us be able to take it as many animals as possible and, and, and keep people from waiting. Um, we do need to, uh, we do see emergencies when we need to, mm -hmm. but we do um, go by appointments if possible. Okay. Wonderful. And we'll put up the information on uh, on the screen so our right. viewers know where to find you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you and for having us. And bringing Elsa? Uh, yeah, Elsa, yes. Elsa. Bye, Elsa. It was great meeting you. You're a good girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary Lou. Thanks. Looking for a different type of summer activity on the water? Well, we have one for you. You'll find out more right after the break. Welcome back to Suncoast FYI. Looking for a different type of activity to do this summer on the water? Well then, taking part in Moat Marine's Lionfish Derby might be just the thing you'd like to try. I'm joined now by Content Development Manager Haley Rutger to talk more about that. Thank you for being on the program. Oh yeah, it's great to be here. And Lionfish Derby, what's, what makes this so special and why do we do it? Well, we do it because the lionfish, as beautiful and tasty as it might be, uh, mm -hmm. is an invasive species in our waters and is quite a problem for the Gulf of Mexico, yeah. the Caribbean. Um, it eats other native fish. So we are doing, as what, doing what we can to remove as many of okay. them as possible. Okay. So how many years has this been taking place? This is the fifth annual Sarasota Lionfish okay. Derby. Moat has hosted four of them. Um, it's really a great time every year. And, and how many typically do you find the fishermen catch? Well, at our derby, it can be hundreds. Yeah. Uh, at other derbies organized by the group Reef that leads these derbies, it may even be more than we get here. Okay. So okay. it's a good it's a good way to make an impact. Okay. So you said that they're, they're an, an invasive species. So how does this benefit our environment overall? Well, it's uh, helping protect the native species that the lionfish might otherwise have been consuming. What do they, what do they eat? What kind of native fish do they eat? A number of uh, native sport or food fishes they uh -huh. could eat um, at different stages of life. I'm not even sure if we know all of what they can yeah. eat, but yeah. at the derby we uh, get to dissect some. Uh -huh. Helps us look at their stomach contents sure. and understand that a little better. Okay. So um, you catch them. And what happens to them after? Mm, that's the fun part. Because you said they were good eating fish. They, they are good yeah, eating. Yeah. <laughs> They're a nice mild white fish and uh -huh. we have chefs from uh, a whole variety of wonderful local restaurants who come to the Derby on the last day mm -hmm. uh, and they cook those fish in different dishes and they're actually going to compete this year um, okay. to see who can make the best dish. So where will that happen? So the, the chefs will come to what location? They'll come to our location at Moat Marine Laboratory uh, and do that uh, cooking and you can actually get a ticket for tasting their wonderful dishes even if you're not diving in the derby. Okay, so when does the derby take place? So it's July 6th through 8th. Okay. So that's actually, uh, it's starting today it's on starting July, July 6th, 6th, right? Yeah. And um, the captains get together today. Is that what I read? The captains get together and kind of figure it out. And then they go out on the water tomorrow? Yeah, there's an evening captains meeting and then um, the boats go out and people, divers are going down there to um, spear and hunt these fish and bring them back. Um, and then on Sunday, uh, the 8th, there's a weigh-in. Okay. We find out who caught the most fish, et okay. cetera. All and right. we have the wonderful tasting opportunity. All right. And what time does that start? That it starts at noon at most. At uh, noon. So um, I wrote down, I, you have uh, a chef from Madison's 41 coming. Mm -hmm. uh, indigenous. Correct. Michael's on East. 
and modern events. Yeah. Yeah. So, and uh, I think there's even one or two more. Two so more we're we're doing really great. Our local chefs really have shown that they care about this uh, issue and want to help. Okay. So. Um, besides coming and enjoying the event, are there other ways that the public can get involved? Yeah, well the public can learn more about lionfish from Moat, from our partners at the Reef Environmental Education Foundation who do a whole series of lionfish derbies, mm -hmm. and from uh, state institutions like the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. You can contact any of these groups to find out how you can help stem the invasion and share education with the okay. rest of the Florida Now, um, fishermen, uh, how can they register? Well, you can go to Moat's website, yep. moat.org forward slash lionfish. You can register your teams um, for the Derby, and if you just want to come to the Sunday event, then you can just register for a tasting ticket. Okay, okay. Now, um, how many people to a team? Um, I believe it's just a, sh a small handful, up to four, I believe. Okay, okay. And what is the cost of that, Haley? It's $120 to register your team. So whether you're two people, three or four, it's the it's $120 for a team? Yeah, per okay. team. Yeah. So do you have to have a, a specific captain to, captain to go out with? You said when, you know, the captains get together and and meet. Are they the, they're the team leader? Is that yeah, what they are? Yeah, it's my understanding that you bring your, your vessel and take it out and uh, you, you work out your own strategy of where you're going to go, okay. where you're going to look for lionfish. All right, now you said diving or spear fishing. Is that the only way it's done or do you actually catch them as well? They are typically caught um, by spearing um, because they are, they can be in deeper areas. Okay. Um, it can be hard to catch. It, they're not typically caught in the traditional way, so usually it's divers that go out and, and catch them. Okay. And um, so when people want to go tasting, is it just one set ticket or is it per how many tastes you want? Do you it's know a taste, that? Yeah, just a $15 tasting ticket for Sunday and that okay. will allow you to taste the different dishes and um, be part of the, the cooking competition. Okay, wonderful. Learned all about that really quickly because we only have a few uh, moments left. You have another event coming up July 25th through 28th. What mm -hmm. is that? It's a very special event because Moat is a shark research hub. So we have something called Shark Days okay. in that on those days. And there are multiple different activities, including online and in-person um, fun things that the family can do to learn more about sharks and the Great. science behind them. Good. OK, well, all of that's on your website. So our yeah. viewers can go there and find out more. Yeah, they sure can. Great. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Coming up next on Suncoast FYI, a look at a program helping connect the elderly with young people in the community. That's next on Suncoast FYI. Welcome back to Suncoast FYI. CADA helps connect young children with senior citizens to promote shared experiences. We're joined now by the managing director and co-founder, Ann Chandra. Hi. Hi, thank you for having me. A lot of, to talk about more than your organization, but we'll start yes. with that yes. first. Yes. So what is CADA and what does it stand for? And what do you do? Yes, A lot, lot in one question. Yeah. <laughs> so CADA stands for Kids and Elders Through Arts. And basically our goal, our mission, is to connect the older generation with the younger generation through a shared experience mm -hmm. in the arts. And when, what inspired you? How did this start and when, when did it start? When did it start? We started about eight years ago mm -hmm. and uh, I actually love telling this story because um, I still remember it like it was yesterday but my husband and I are both musicians he's a clarinetist I'm a violinist and we both have private students so we you know when your student has been practicing and has a, a piece they want to perform you want to try to find a venue where they will have an audience and mm -hmm. retirement communities are great because yeah. they all want to go to a you know go to a performance yeah. so we were at uh, one of these retirement communities doing a recital with our students, okay. and the recital was great. And afterwards, um, a lot of the kids had come down and sort of interact, started interacting with the older people. Uh -huh. And we saw so many, you know, people just talking and uh -huh. smiling and how... And I, lighting I thought, up. Yeah, and lighting up. Oh, gotcha. And I thought, wow, I didn't I expect, didn't really expect it. I, you know, it was a surprise. And the um, actually one of the women had, it was, I think it was um, holiday time, and uh -huh. she had made like a Christmas ornament for all the students who had performed. Oh. And so she was in a wheelchair and she was talking to them and giving this to them. And, oh and then I realized also that the conversation kept going. It didn't just stop at, you know, talking about the music that they just played, but yeah. they, they had a conversation. And so I, we both thought, wow, it'd be cool to do this all over as yeah. much as we could. So, yeah. so obviously 
this is why it's important. Yeah. So where did you take it from there? So from there, we decided we have to, you know, we had to go through the process of forming a nonprofit, mm -hmm. which is a lot. It is. It's a lot. <laughs> it is work. a lot. Oh my gosh. Um, but that was that was great. And then our first project, I think we did at a place, um, Plymouth Harbor. Mm -hmm. um, and we had students perform, and they were they. What, what our, our what we love doing is having not only students and or young people and older people meet, but having them meet over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So not just once, but over a, a, a weekly, you know, even once a week or or something like that. So they actually have a bond where they they can talk about, and it grows into actually a relationship. Okay. How do they, how do you so, manage that? How do they get together on a weekly basis? We um, so we have we'll have a project we set up, and then I basically I work with the communications director, the activities director at a retirement community, and she does all that part for me. Okay. And then I work with the students, and then we sort of communicate that way, and then we set up meeting times, and I would go with them and mm -hmm. things like that. So. Okay. Yeah. Now, I imagine that a lot of our elderly community also are musicians, yes. possibly. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot to share with the students back and forth. Yes, right? and it's not just music we do. That's why we sort of put this umbrella of the arts, because we want okay. it to be anything. It can be poetry. It can be, um, we have a woman uh, that uh, often performs a from a play or something. Uh -huh. So it can be visual art. It can be music, but it can be really Anything, anything that can fit dance, under that cat. Dance, drama. Yeah. Yes. So all of those come all into of play. Those things, yeah. So where else do you, do you perform? Do you set up programs yeah, around? Yeah, usually the, it's, it's with a retirement community. That's where we've had the most okay. success. Okay. And it's easy that way because we have people to help on that side. Okay. Um, so usually, yeah, we do it at retirement okay. communities and so, bring the children. But so the retirement in. communities, that's they should really contact you mm -hmm, yes. about having different performances yeah, or, throughout the year. It's not right. just one particular time and our of the year, right? Yes, and our performances are one uh, something that we do um, pretty much twice a year. Mm -hmm. We didn't do it twice a year this year because of Irma, but um, is we ha it's a similar to a recital, but it's yeah. actually much more unique in that we have the students, um, three or four students come to a retirement community, and then the retirement com community has three or four of their residents perform as well, uh -huh. music cool. or what I, you know. Yeah. And then at the end, they they all are on stage, and we ask them a few questions, they ask each other questions, yeah. and even then, from that short amount of time, you know, they're like, oh, that's interesting, wow, he's 85 years old, and yeah. he used to play the violin, and yes. he used to go to school like me, and, yes. um, yeah. and then after we have a little reception, and they, end up talking more. Okay. So what's the most rewarding part for the, you? I think the most rewarding part is just watching and listening and yeah. seeing and like you said they light up and both yeah. both I think you know the kids I think are sort of surprised at how much they like the older yes. people you know and uh, the older people you know these are treasures of our yes. community yep. and I think right now they're sort of compartmentalized mm -hmm. but this way, you know, they're sharing their stories. They have great yeah. stories and all these, you know, things to share. And um, yeah. so that part is the best, just okay. watching it happen okay. and how quickly that bond can, yes. can form. And that's it. When the arts transcend, transcend age, because I work at an art college and uh -huh. I see that if the love is there, mm -hmm. the age doesn't matter. Exactly. It doesn't matter. Exactly. Can, can I read the statement that you sure. have on your, sure. your, I really love this. It says, um, our community elders are our most valuable resource, matched only by the unlimited, unlimited potential of our children. Did you write that? No, that we was. We both wrote it. I think both my husband and I, yeah. And you wrote it. <laughs> I just thought Can't that was, that's perfect. That's oh, perfect. So I know you have a lot of projects coming up and our viewers can go to your website yes. and find out more. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. The weekend is almost here. So if you're looking for something to do, we have some suggestions that we'd like to share when we come back. Coming up this weekend on the Sun Coast, this July is Selby Splash and Saturdays Month. The event takes place at Selby Gardens every Saturday from July 7th until July 28th. For more information, call 941-366-5731. And enjoy the 8th Midsummer Maine Lobster Fest at the Italian American Club of Venice. For more information, call 941 468 
1-800-500-5013. If you would like to promote your community event on Suncoast FYI, we would love to hear from you. This is a complimentary service. Please call our producer, Robert Pandolfino, at 941-361-4616. To view previous episodes, go to snntv.com under programming. I'm Nancy O'Neill, and we'll see you next Friday on Suncoast FYI.